have a few short biographies of which I'll really reduce down because I wouldn't want to embarrass some of the speakers here. Starting with the, the second speaker first, since uh, it's, uh, we have two speakers, usually you only have one, and we're kind of lucky at this stage to be able to get actually two people, and two people that are able to explain the uh, piece of hardware they're going to be discussing very well because they're intimately involved with it and have been for at least a case of Bob Warrenstein for a considerable period of time. The second speaker we're going to be hearing from is going to be talking about the technical side, and that's Patrick Noreen. And he's gra both of these people are graduated gra from Canadian universities. Patrick graduated from McMaster University and went from there to ComDev uh, down in Cambridge here in Ontario, then from ComDev to Mel here in Ottawa, was it? Yeah. In Ottawa. And then moving around a little bit, got into the uh, Can Can Canadian Space Agency and the RadarSat program. And his experience will be shown, I think, in terms of the synthetic aperture radar, but he'll be talking also about the overall spacecraft. Bob Warren will be leaving off, leading off, and he graduated from Sino you know, High School, Port Credit, Mississauga. How much of a hometown boy can that? That's pretty hometown, I think. And graduated from the University of Toronto in 1949. I hate to say that, but oh well. <laughs> He's worked on a number of uh, very interesting uh, projects and with different companies and drifting more towards, or well, perhaps the companies were the ones that drifted more into what has now become SPAR Aerospace. And he's walk, worked on a number of spacecraft you know, associated with that, uh, that group or that engineering group. Those names have changed over the years. One is the structure of the Alouette satellite, indicating he's, uh, more, he's a bit of a mechanical person, true to my own heart. And he also worked on the ISIS satellite, and uh, in 1972 joined the Department of Communications for Mechanical Engineering on Communication Technology Satellite, which was later named Hermes, which the engineering model, I'm not sure if it's still there, but it was at the Museum of Science Technology on display. I haven't been there for a little while, so I'm not sure if it's still on display. Late in the 70s, joined the uh, MSAT team working on the initial or concept designs for that, and since 1981, he's been working on radar sat, and part of his presentation are going to show he's going to talk about how these darn things evolve over time. And certainly, the initial concepts are perhaps somewhat different from what we're building today. So, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce first of all Bob Warren. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What a, a pleasure it is to uh, to be with you. And uh, I'm very impressed, as your president said, to see so many people out on a horrible night like this. And I sure hope that Patrick and I can enlighten you and entertain you enough to make it uh, worth a while to come away and miss street legal. <laughs> I, I myself uh, am not a, uh, an amateur astronomer. Um, I do. I have been uh, going out for about 33, 34 odd years now to uh, to look at satellites, which uh, happen to be my fascination. And also, I've had the the good fortune and the real pleasure to have worked on uh, the various Canadian satellite programs during that period of time. So I guess I, I share with you the the fresh night air and staring upwards and uh, seeing things go by. But uh, in my case, it's, it's usually trying to identify which, which satellite it is and whose satellite it is. The, uh, the general field we're in here is, is remote sensing. And uh, Canada has been very active in this since about the early 70s. In 1972, the Canada Center for Remote Sensing was formed, the federal government uh, group here in Ottawa. And they have... Uh, established quite a world reputation for uh, the quality of, of work they do. But until now, all of the work they have done has been in work derived from uh, other people's satellites, taking data from other people's satellites, uh, together with a fairly healthy airborne program. They have uh, some very advanced work done both in optical sensors and radar sensors with a fleet of aircraft uh, operated out of uplands and uh, other aircraft in industry. About 1977, the government uh, 
did a, uh, one of their white papers called Satellites and Sovereignty. And it was decided at that time that uh, Canada really should be doing something of its own in the way of uh, surveillance with regard to coastal waters and so forth. And um, so the uh, Canada Centre for Remote Sensing uh, at that time became involved in a cooperative effort with NASA on uh, the CSAT spacecraft. This was, as the name implies, a satellite that uh, had a variety of uh, sensors on it to uh, look at the ocean, uh, scatterometers and um, radiometers, and a, uh, an L-band SAR, synthetic aperture radar. I'll keep saying SAR, thinking that everybody knows what it is, but uh, it's just that special kind of uh, radar that uh, enables us to get very good uh, resolution with uh, quite a small sized uh, antenna itself. The Americans put up uh, CSAT in uh, 1978, and Canada was uh, uh, cooperative in the sense that we established a ground station out in Shoe Cove, way out in the east coast of Newfoundland, and also had uh, McDonald Detweiler working on, uh, on the processing side of it. And uh, in fact, somewhat to the uh, annoyance of the Americans, when the satellite was launched, the, the first and the best imagery that came down from CSAT was the, uh, the Canadian uh, image that was taken of uh, the bridge, the, the, the town of the city of Trois-Rivières. And, uh, but the, the satellite, um, although the name is CSAT, uh, because of the Canadian involvement, uh, it was planned to take imagery over much of Canada, over land masses, geological features, and, and particularly the ocean regions. It was in a polar orbit, so it could get all of those ocean regions. The satellite itself lasted only for about 90 days, and then there was a massive uh, short circuit. Uh, some people, uh, I think with tongue in cheek, but I'm not too sure, have claimed that the, the resolution of it was so remarkably good that, the, uh, that the, the CIA or somebody decided they better blow that one up and get it, out of the, get it off the air. But uh, nonetheless, the imagery from it uh, in that brief period of time that it was alive uh, was enough to show that with this radar you could, you could see things uh, that you could not see with the conventional optical sensors carried on, on the Landsat series. And um, the main thing you could do with them is take a really beautiful picture on a night like this when it's uh, snowing like mad and there's no sunlight. Uh, optical sensors, just as you and I with our 35 mils, have to wait for a, a nice sunny day. And uh, indeed, there are many areas of the world where the cloud cover is so persistent that they have never even yet got a single, uh, single picture. Uh, but all that has changed when we get into the realm of radar satellites because they um, have that ability. And um, so as you will see when we uh, get on with the show, what we have with RadarSat is uh, quite an advanced version of this, of this beast. After the early CSAT I mentioned, uh, there were two shuttle-based experiments in 1981, uh, a radar called the synthetic, synthetic uh, no, shuttle imaging radar, SIR, uh, Surrey flew. And then on Mark and O's flight in uh, October of 84, they had another one, Sir B. And they, uh, again, we were cooperative in that and arranged for Canadian regions to be covered. And then there was uh, quite a pause until the uh, ALMAZ went up, uh, the Russian satellite, uh, which has been getting uh, some pictures. And then, of course, recently the ERS-1 satellite, which uh, you probably heard about, the satellite of the European Space Agency. And it um, has been getting just splendid pictures. However, that's a, a research satellite, very narrow swath with, with the uh, time uh, available with the power source and the data recording to be shared amongst many experiments on board. Uh, so what we will be able to offer with RadarSat is a, is a continuous coverage, uh, very high-powered satellite, so we can leave the radar on for most of the orbit. Uh, 
well, for a good part of the orbit and uh, uh, very wide swathing capabilities. And uh, so let me just flash up a picture of how it is today. I'll, I'll be going into uh, detail of some of the structural features later on. But uh, just to give you an idea of scale, the, the gold thing at the bottom, which is our antenna, is 15 meters tip to tip. And the uh, wingspan is about 19 meters. And uh, the body there would be about from here to the ceiling in height is about how big it is. We uh, went, we got there by a rather arduous path, however, because uh, in the early days, uh, there were many ideas on what sort of sensors we should be carrying. And um, this is a, of an 18, a 1982 vintage in which we had uh, a huge uh, reflector antenna here with a little feed. And uh, in those days, we, were, we had the uh, same scatter scatterometer that the um, uh, CSAT had, these little broomsticks out here, and uh, an optical sensor. We, we thought we'd probably put on a thematic mapper as, the, um, as they have in the, uh, the current version of Landsat. That, uh, that huge antenna up overhead, though, it was not much of a winner. And um, so we moved to a, a planar antenna, which uh, goes something like this. There it is hovering over Vancouver. And uh, by now we have uh, moved, we're now able to move into quite a, a, a chunky design of satellite, a body of satellite here. Uh, the solar arrays were drawn from the uh, flexible arrays of the Olympus spacecraft. Uh, that's a European Space Agency high power communication satellite for which Canada made the uh, flexible antennas, uh, flexible solar arrays rather. And um, we were at this point in time uh, being carried on the space shuttle, uh, which was uh, to be launched from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in the West Coast. And uh, one has to launch from the West Coast to go into a polar orbit. Uh, you simply can't get into a polar orbit from, uh, from Cape Kennedy. The launch site out there was an extremely ambitious and expensive one. And uh, uh, however, we were assured that it, it would be ready in time for us. And um, at that time, you may recall back around 1984, NASA was doing some wonderful things in, in, along the line of going out and repairing satellites. A satellite called Solar Max was repaired, and some defunct uh, communication satellites were hauled back into the shuttle and fixed. And so we uh, became quite keen on the idea of having uh, RadarSat designed to be capable of in-orbit servicing, which would enable us to go up and uh, fix it five years later or so. And uh, it's handy, too, with a shuttle because you can put it on the end of the arm and make sure that the deployments all work and um, so forth. And if they don't work, then uh, you can send an astronaut out to, to make them work. And uh, that version of the spacecraft looked something like this uh, coming down with uh, a little uh, engine on the back end here, which uh, was a bipropellant liquid fuel system that the Olympus uh, bus had. And with that, we could fly from the rather low altitude of the space shuttle up to our operating altitude of 800 kilometers and work for five years and then zoom on down again. And um, we had quite a variety of bits and pieces that we could, we could change out on the spacecraft. This shows the solar array being replaced. This fellow is tucking the other one down there. The, uh, all these boxes with, with numbers on them so they don't get it wrong were uh, equipped so they could be unplugged and put uh, in handy spots. And this, in fact, is what was done with the uh, Solar Max satellite. It was the same uh, A-prime frame, as they call it, that was used there. It's a rotating table so the, uh, 
the spacecraft can be uh, indexed around to where you want it. And the uh, grapple fixture is here that enables the, uh, the cannon arm to uh, take it out of the bay and put it into orbit. What happened next was the Challenger blew up. And along with it went, uh, although NASA weren't ready to admit it very swiftly, it took them about a year, along with it went all hope of launching the shuttle ever from the Western Test Range. The, um, the United States Air Force, who were the main proponent of that uh, launch site, uh, quickly lost uh, interest and went ahead and built some nice high-powered uh, rockets of their own, the Titan III and IV. And um, so we had to swing into an entirely new uh, configuration, which was launchable on a, an expendable rocket. And uh, the configuration we have here is one which showed the uh, a new a bunch of sensors which were uh, being provided by, Brit by Britain, uh, a radar altimeter, extremely precise uh, uh, altimeter in the, what they call a centimeter class. That's the accuracy of knowing the altitude from 800 uh, kilometers and uh, a, called an, a, a long track scanning radiometer. This was an advanced version of the radiometer on board the ERS-1. And um, so we were going merrily along with that one, the, the sort of uh, detailed labeled version goes something like this with these uh, instruments on the bottom. And um, the uh, whole idea, of course, of in-orbit servicing was, was no longer valid at all. So it was, uh, in a sense, it was much simpler satellite to build. Uh, the next problem came when the uh, British government suddenly decided, because of some uh, political changes and the ruthlessness of one Maggie Thatcher, to just totally drop out of the whole program. But they'd been with us uh, for about seven years and had been working, um, certainly working very well with us and spending a lot of their money. So uh, it was uh, it was one of the many sort of lows in the program. We uh, one of the major setbacks we had was that uh, another space program, the uh, space station, at a certain point in time came back with a, uh, a revised estimate which uh, needed them uh, needed a, an additional $400 million and we thought we would bite the dust at that point. Um, but we persevered and again when Britain pulled out it looked pretty bad. But what happened was that SPAR went quite swiftly to uh, uh, select a commercial brand of, uh, of payload bus, uh, of bus for the spacecraft. In general, these spacecraft can be considered uh, in two pieces. One is the, what we call the payload, where the instrument is and, and usually the data recording system. And then at the other end is the bus, the platform, the service module, it goes by various names, which does the job of providing power, the, the uh, solar arrays that go with it. Uh, it provides the, uh, the telemetry little antennas here and at the top which are uh, to receive commands going up to the satellite and, and to provide the uh, telemetry uh, data stream coming down uh, on state of health. And uh, it provides the attitude control uh, maneuvering to uh, hold it fixed in its uh, attitude and also with little uh, propulsion jets you see at the back end here, uh, it can, uh, by turning those on, it can accelerate itself uh, and get back into the orbit it was supposed to, even at 800 kilometers. There's just enough drag to uh, keep pulling you down. And the, uh, the supplier whom Spar selected was the uh, Ball Aerospace Corporation in Boulder. And it just so happened that they had uh, just launched a uh, satellite of their own, which uh, was very similar in terms of its, its bus capabilities to what we needed. And so uh, it, it provided, uh, at quite low cost, a, a space-proven uh, bunch of subsystems so that it, 
is now moving ahead very swiftly. And indeed, the uh, so-called structural model of the bus is already out at the David Florida Laboratories in, um, in Western Ottawa. The bottom end, uh, of course, is the, uh, the payload with a SAR antenna like that. And uh, a rather large dish here is the, the data itself, the X-band uh, frequency downlink for the, the data from the radar is distinct from the housekeeping kind of uh, data which the telemetry system puts out at S-band. Solar arrays are being made by SPAR in Toronto and uh, they're all uh, flexible, uh, not, not flexible, they're rigid, uh, but they fold like an accordion. Uh, this is a, a view of the uh, satellite at launch. And uh, with the uh, return to good old fashioned rockets, we had to tightly uh, package the spacecraft into a little uh, 10 foot diameter shroud here. And so we see the, uh, the solar arrays uh, stacked up here uh, and the SAR antenna uh, located here. And uh, you recall from that last picture that they both go out in the same direction so that uh, the SAR antenna comes down sort of like a, a W that flattens itself out or letter M, depending which way you're looking at it. And, uh, and, then, one, and then the uh, solar array has to, has to sort of come out and go around the corner here and so that it can come out in the same direction. Very tricky. But anyway, that's the, uh, the way it will look when it sits inside the, uh, the Delta II rocket. Extremely reliable rocket made by McDonnell Douglas. Uh, Canada has launched uh, 12 satellites so far with the Delta, and it's extremely reliable. And, um, and the company is very accommodating and in providing information and hardware and, and very precise trajectories, too. Just an idea of how big the bird is. Uh, the mass of it is uh, about 2.7 metric tons and um, power up around two and a half watts. The, uh, the solar array uh, beginning of life and end of life figures look like this. And the, um, the bus uh, draws a bit of power, but the main power consumer, of course, is, is Patrick's big uh, SAR radar. We have quite high-powered batteries on board uh, provided by a French company, SAFT, uh, because we do occasionally go into orbit, uh, go into eclipse. In general, the, uh, the orbit is, uh, is almost eternally in sunlight. Uh, we have uh, what's called a sun-synchronous orbit, which means simply that uh, as seen from the sun, no matter what time of year, the, uh, the uh, orbit is always uh, flat on to the sun, so we're always sort of riding around in the twilight zone. But um, because we don't go right over the pole and because of the 23 degrees of uh, Earth tilt, we do uh, during midsummer, just as we're going under uh, in the Antarctic region, we clip into a bit of um, eclipse there. But, uh, and and uh, we do need batteries for that. And indeed, we use the batteries even during 100% sunlight because when we, uh, it's been sized that way so that we can um, uh, economize on the solar array power. So much then on the, on the design of the satellite. Uh, the, the mission concept, as we call it, uh, looks something like this, where the uh, satellite is, uh, seen uh, shooting a little swath up here as it heads north. And uh, the red stuff is the, is the SAR data. It comes down to a station uh, in Ottawa, comes down to a station in Prince Albert. And the Americans, who did I mention, are, are providing this beautiful Delta rocket free of charge, uh, are uh, are in return getting data over the uh, over United States, and they have their uh, station up in Fairbanks. And um, when it's when it's processed, it can, if need be, this isn't the normal channel, but if uh, there is a great urgency of getting the data out, 
we can link directly to a ship if it happens to be a ship stuck in the ice or um, some other emergency situation. Uh, we can get it there very directly. The Mission Control uh, Center will uh, likely be at the new uh, Space Agency uh, facility at uh, Saint Hubert in Quebec. The, um, the downlinking uh, of the data comes into uh, those two stations. This is what you see on the hill up in, uh, in Gatineau, if you ever noticed when you're going up to uh, Ski Mont Cascade or if you're going on up to uh, St. Pierre de Wakefield, just when you go past Cantley, you can see the silhouette of these on the hillside, on the hilltop rather. And um, what they have been using them for, the, the first dish they, they put up was uh, being used for a Landsat and still is uh, indeed. And then more recently they have uh, begun to work the spot uh, the spot uh, satellite, which is another remote sensing satellite of somewhat higher quality than Landsat. And then just recently the, uh, the other dish was commissioned over here to uh, receive the ERS-1 radar. Canada is a, is a participant in the ERS-1 program. McDonald Detweiler have installed uh, ground uh, processing facilities uh, in a lot of the European locales. Now from a little dish like that sitting on a hill over where you play hockey, where you, where you go skiing rather, you can see rather a long way uh, when the satellite is at uh, 800 kilometers. This circle here, if you can sort of discern Canada in the background there amongst all these hula hoops. Uh, but look how far you can see. You can pick up this satellite as it comes in over Greenland, Baffin Island. Uh, it eclipses all the way out to past where the uh, Prince Albert station is there. And if this map went on down, you could see it all the way into, uh, into Cuba and, uh, and southern Florida. So you get uh, tremendous coverage with such a satellite. And the other two circles show the ground station coverage from Prince Albert and Fairbanks. And all these stripy things represent the uh, coverage you get. Um, the ones going that away are the northbound passes, and uh, the ones coming down that away are the southbound passes. But with the wide swath coverage we have, 500 kilometer swath coverage we have, um, and the power we have, we can run this thing for 28 minutes every orbit, you can cover all of that. And, and the key thing here is right up in this region, because you'll notice the uh, Northwest Passage, which goes right through there, uh, bringing oil down from uh, the Beaufort Sea one of these days, um, is totally covered in a given day. It's covered many times in a given day, but if you were in an icebreaker stuck up there, you'd be jolly uh, glad to know that this coverage was coming in as reliably as it is. And uh, with what we advertise, and we might even be able to achieve a, a four-hour turnaround so that from, I don't Patrick will probably tell you the truth, but that's what I've been told, is that from four hours from when the satellite goes overhead, not only will you get an image of where you are, but you'll get an annotated image showing where the, where the uh, motions of the ice um, are going because the, the stuff moves around up there and gives you a a dangerous uh, squeeze occasionally. Here's what we see within a three-day coverage. We've now, we could access all of that region that is in yellow now. Just occasional little blips, uh, little gap diamonds as I call them at the bottom are, are still inaccessible. Okay, well I've probably overshot my time and uh, I'll let uh, Patrick get into the more interesting de details of the uh, of the payload and the application area. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As Bob suggests, I'm responsible for the part of the satellite that we call the payload. And as I tease Bob, this is the part of the satellite that actually pays for the mission. Um, really and truly, it's the part of the satellite that carries the SAR, the synthetic aperture radar itself. I will be attempting to give you a brief and a basic overview of SAR. If I try to give you any more details, it will take about five days. But nevertheless, I'll start with applications for SAR so you understand why it is 
the Canadian government is funding this radar, the satellite-based radar, and then going to the operations of the actual radar. And a little bit of the detail as to the hardware we're putting into the payload to make the radar work. By way of application, one of the prime purpose of the, the radar, the radar sat radar, is for shipping fisheries, as I have here. This diagram is an actual image taken from a, a SAR. It's not the radar sat image since we haven't flown it as yet. But what it shows the trained eye, people who are trained in observing radar imagery, it will show a number of details. It was actually taken, I think, by a, a spacecraft SAR system on the, um, the southeast coast of Spain. What you can see, if it was a bit clearer, is the actual depth of the channel. This is part of the Mediterranean. By studying this radar image, people who do oceanography could tell you the exact, well, not the exact, the rough art of estimate, the actual depth of the channels. And they could use images like this, which, which could not be observed. These sort of features could not be observed with a straight optical image. They could use this to detect exactly where the fish, the fish stock might be hidden, or the, the feeding grounds of certain fish stock. So it would be very useful for our caught fishermen in the East Coast. This image was taken by, by the Sorbi radar that Bob alluded to early on. And it's actually an image taken, it's upside down. It should be something like that. This part is a landmass that shows the, the southeast part of England by, by Brighton area. And somewhere down here is France. And interestingly enough, they were able to observe some underwater channels in English Channel. And what they found is that the, these gullies were actually some of the deepest part in the English Channel. And using optical, again, using just optical images is almost undetectable. Incidentally, what they did find when they did some sounding, that the depth in the sea was indeed part of the deepest part of the English Channel. And some of the, and trust me, during the Second World War, some of the German submarine commanders knew of this channel. And they would actually hide within this channel and wait for the surface ships to come around before they torpedo them. So there's another interesting application. This shows another trail related to oil pollution monitoring. The nice thing about a SAR image, it gives you a very big picture. The SWAT size is very large. It's up to 100 kilometers, 500 kilometers. What this shows is an, a ship and the oil spill is left behind. Because Canada is really surrounded by a lot of water, most of which is covered in ice, and because of the push towards the North Sea development, oil drilling, etc. It's very important that the, the people working in the oil drills and ships that ply these oceans understand what type of ice is in their surrounding neighborhood. The thing you can get out of a SAR image, which is very difficult to get out of an optical image, is actual properties of the ice. With a SAR image, you could determine whether it's a first-year ice you're looking at or a multi-year ice. The multi-year ice, of course, tends to be thicker and harder and more difficult to break through. That's what this image is showing. It can also be used to track the progress of icebergs as they travel through the, the North Sea. That was the last bullet I had there. Some of the other more useful applications involve crop monitoring. What this picture shows, this is the actual SAR image itself. And people trained to look for these features in the SAR image could tell exactly what type of crop is within each one of these patches, since the particular crops have a different ref reflectivity, or they respond differently to radar signals. And this, that's, that is seen by the intensity of the radar image. So you could discern between wheat, canola, or fallow. Fairly easy.
one of the other features I've listed here is forestry management. With a, with a SAR image, especially one that's uh, taken from a satellite high above in the sky, you could image very, very large area of forestry, and you could track how the deforestation is, progress, is progressing. Another use of SARS is geological mapping. None of these images photocopy very well, unfortunately, black and white images. But this is another landmass somewhere in Europe. I think this one was taken as well by a European spacecraft SAR radar. And if you overlay this slide, you could track things like faults within the, the, the uh, mountain, um, trend lines, and any other artifacts that are interested geologists. Another feature that a SAR provides, a satellite going SAR, you can see very, as I said, very large areas. What this indicates is an actual meteorite impact on part of the Earth. And you can see clearly the circumference of that meteorite. For a more familiar SAR image, this is actually Ottawa. I think I've got it pointing in the right direction. This is the bridges over the Ottawa River, Hull, and Aylmer somewhere around here. So you could use it to do very large mapping, as I said, of areas, whether it be developed areas or undeveloped areas. And I think Bob already had mentioned that with a SAR image, you could take it any time of the day, whether it's snowing, whether it's raining, whether it's overcast. The SAR image would provide a, a good representation of what's below. Okay, that's all I want to say in terms of applications. They're numerous, some of which I've just touched. As I said, I'll try to very briefly explain why we use a SAR image. Why is it better than a, a normal radar image? A SAR, as the name implies, is a synthetic aperture radar. And what it's doing, in essence, is synthesizing or falsely creating a larger antenna than it actually has. And it does this by moving the radar platform, or the satellite in this case. It could be an aircraft as well. What happens is that each point in the ground, if this is the ground and the spacecraft is traveling in this direction, each point in the ground is received by the satellite. And through a process called Doppler processing, we could synthesize a large antenna that we we're actually flying. I'm just going to show you two pages of actual equations to prove that a SAR image is, has a better resolution. And that's all that really matters to any radar is the resolution. And when I speak of resolution, I'll speak of resolution in two plane. I'll speak of resolution in, along the direction that the satellite is flying, which is called the azimuth direction, and resolution in the direction perpendicular to the satellite track, which is called the range direction. The basic principle of SAR is really its ability to create a synthetic antenna. And as I've said here, a conventional radar, typically the resolution in the azimuth direction, is related to the wavelength of the frequency being transmitted, the range from the radar to the target, that's this distance here, and the actual diameter of the antenna. So this would be the typical result you'll get out of a, a normal radar, stationary radar, that's not doing any sort of Doppler processing. For a SAR, however, the resolution is equivalent to the wavelength times the range times two times the, the, um, the SWAT, the SWAT length in this direction. And if you work out the, the, the simple algebra, you find that the resolution of a SAR is D, DAT, which is, again, the diameter of the antenna it's actually flying, divided by 2. It's totally unrelated to the wavelength or the range.
in the in the cross track direction or in the range direction the SAR radar operates the same as any FM radar. And this, this direction, as you might recall, this is what I'm calling the range or the cross track direction. It sends out an FM pulse. And for those of you who might not be familiar with that term, it's simply the same type of signal a bat would emit. An FM pulse is a signal in time which has a varying frequency. It's not constant over time. It's very similar to the chirp signal given out by bats to help them guide when they're flying. So if the radar transmits an FM pulse and on the received waveform, it delays the pulse in a particular fashion that's in an opposite direction to the transmitted signal, the resulting compressed pulse would be much smaller than the transmitted pulse. In this way, the, the satellite or the SAR radar achieves a very fine resolution in the across track or range direction. If you were to compare it again to the to the normal radars, the ones which are not using FM signals or frequency modulated signal, you find that the resolution in the range direction again is equivalent just to the pulse width, the transmitted pulse width, which would be some large pulse to get the power required out of the transmitter, multiplied by the speed of light divided by two. For a linear FM SAR, what you find is that the the transmitted pulse is equivalent to 1 over the chirp bandwidth. So depending on the bandwidth, the actual frequency span that we transmit, we could bring the compressed pulse to a very, very small number, as you can see here. And the resulting resolution becomes the speed of light divided by 2 divided by the bandwidth. So the larger the bandwidth of the, the, the radar, the finer the resolution the radar can image. So much for background and as the SARS themselves. The SAR that CSA is flying, or hope to fly in 1995, on radar SAR, will have the following main characteristics. It will be operating in C-band, 5.3 gigahertz. And there's various reasons for selecting this particular frequency. It's mostly because it's, it's the, one of the better frequencies for imaging ice. And ice is a very important application for Canada. The bandwidth we'll be using, and I think this is the first radar of its type, will be a multiplicity of bandwidths rather than a fixed bandwidth that was used in, for instance, the European satellite that was launched last year. We'll have three bandwidths, which will give us the flexibility, if you can recall from my, one of my previous slides, of actually changing the range resolution of the SAR images, depending on the application we require. The transmitted pulse width will be fixed, and the pulse repetition frequency will be varied from 1,200 to 1,400 hertz. This is to compensate for any variation in the satellite as it flies in its polar orbit. And as I said here, the peak power of transmission is 5 kilowatts. Those are the key parameters. The modes of operation of radar set is shown in this diagram. Some terminologies that you should be familiar with if you want to be an expert in SAR. We'll be flying a multiplicity again of different types of imaging. The first and the most basic kind we call the standard beams. And these will have a SWAT width. And when I say SWAT width, I'm referring to the total area of coverage or the imaging area of approximately 100 kilometers by 100 kilometer and we'll have a specified seven standard beams. For certain applications where we need larger area coverage, we can switch to the so-called white SWAT beams, and they will have over 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers of coverage. For applications where we need even finer details, we'll go to the fine resolution beams, 
And although the, the, the resolution is finer, the, the actual total area covered will be smaller. For even larger areas, we have a mode, which is a force again in, the, in SAR radars. As far as we are aware, no one has ever tried this type of operation. We will go to what we call a scan SAR mode of operation, where we cover the full 500 kilometer. And for some, for some more scientific type experiments, people who want to look out far over the horizon, we have a set of experimental beams which we could refer to. I said there's more details actually in the pamphlet. So that's what the radar will be doing. And to get it to do that, we have to build a payload. The payload, as I said, is the part of the satellite that carries the radar. And this is just a summary of the main components making up the payload, starting with a low power transmitter. And as Bob, I think, already pointed out to you, the payload itself is sitting below the bus. That's the actual payload. And these components I've listed here, subsystems, sits within the payload, within this crucifix, or within the inner side of the payload panels. And probably the only part of the SAR instrument that sits outside the payload is the SAR antenna itself. As a way to explain how the radar works, we start out with what we term the low power transmitter which generates a low power waveform, which is then sent to a high power microwave subsystem, which contains the high power tubes for amplifying the signal. It is then sent to the antenna, the SAR antenna, and transmitted to the ground, or the target we're trying to image. The reflected signal from the ground is coupled back into the antenna, returning to the HPMC, or the high power microwave circuit, and then sent a microwave receiver. In the receiver, the signal is digitized and sent to a timing and data handling subsystem where it's formatted and appended with auxiliary data, such as the ephemeris of the satellite, attitude, etc. The data, the digital data, is then sent to a tape recorder for later playback within the orbit or down directly through the X-band downlink subsystem. The heart of the entire satellite, the thing that gives us the flexibility, it's not really part of the, the signal flow, is the payload computer. And this is the thing that's actually responsible for setting up the different configurations to give the beams we might be requiring. As I said, the, the radar signal starts at a low power transmitter. And this is a brief block diagram for any electrical engineers in the audience. That's what the, the low power transmitter looks like. We have the flexibility, as I said, to do the various types of images and various resolutions. Resolution, because we have a RAM type based waveform generator. We can load any type of waveform, only limited by the bandwidth we need, into a RAM, RAM combination, modulate after a to DTA conversion, and then amplify the signal and send it to the high power microwave circuit. The high, the high power microwave circuit is simply a big tube meant to amplify the low power signal from the low power transmitter. And the configuration we're using on radar sat, because it's, it's meant to be a mission to last for five years, is a redundancy scheme where we have two high power tubes with the, equipped with the necessary cross strapping. Just in case, if throughout the life of the mission or during the life of the mission, any of these tubes should fail, 
fail, we could switch the signal to one part or the other. After the, the signal is amplified within the tube, it is sent to the cell antenna. And here again, we had to build a fairly complex antenna to get the flexibility we require. It's a phased array antenna with 32 elements in this, in this direction, the actually the short direction. And in each of these elements, we could change the phase, thereby steering the beam in the particular direction we require. The, the VPS, or the variable phase shift, phase shifters are controlled by the AIU, the antenna interface unit, which is in turn controlled by the payload computer. Most of what's shown in this electrical block diagram is shown in the mechanical block diagram. That's how it's actually mechanically configured. Here's the radiating panel. That's the 32 radiating panels. They're all mounted in a, 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 a honeycomb panel. And the, I think this is in focus. The AIU sits here. That's the thing that controls the VPS. And the VPS themselves, where are they? They sit somewhere along here to give the, the, the necessary radiating slots or panels the, the required phase. One of the other key elements in the, um, in the SAR is the receiver. And here again, we're doing something that's slightly different from what was ever done before. As I said, we're using three different waveforms. Therefore, we need in the receiver section, after the signal is reflected back from the ground, we need to select the, 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 um, the particular bandwidth we will be processing later on after A to D conversion. And we do that through the use of surface acoustic waves, which are very light and very selective, frequency selective. After the signal is received by the receiver and it is converted, converted from an analog signal into a digital signal, it is then sent to the timing and data handling unit. And this unit is really responsible for receiving, so receiving the data from the receiver and putting certain time tags, parameters, auxiliary data, which it gets from the spacecraft or the payload computer onto the data. The data is then sent either to a tape recorder for later playback or directly to the downlink transmitter, the X-band downlink transmitter. Again, the transmitter has <coughs> redundancy features. And in this case, we're actually using three tubes rather than just two, just to ensure that the radar lasts for the to give them um, three and a quarter years. Therefore, we need a number of switches so that the signal in any of the paths could be routed to any of these tubes before being sent to the antenna. Last but not least, the final subsystem is the payload computer. And this is really the heart of the radar. It controls everything. It receives messages from the bus and it challenges the, challenge the messages to what we call a TCI, a telecommand interface unit. The main part of the computer, all the controls, the algorithms, et cetera, reside in these, these slices, the CPU slice and the memory slice. And as you can see, we have redundancy. We have two computers we're actually flying, again, for the life requirement. All the interface cards that go towards the different subsystems, whether it be the analog cards, 
or serial cards, digital cards, they're all redundant, fully redundant. Last, I would like to mention, because I think Rob asked me to, what do we do after RadarSat 1? RadarSat 1 is scheduled to be launched in January 1995, if everything goes OK. The plan currently by the Canadian Space Agency is to build another satellite similar to RadarSat 1 because of the commercialization they expect RadarSat 1 will generate within Canada. So to keep the, the, the commercial customers with a continuous flow of data, the plan is currently that RadarSat 2 will be identical to RadarSat 1. And it's expected to, this is the actual design, well, there wouldn't be much of design, but it's the actual build phase will last between 1995 to 1999. However, RadarSat 3 will be a new design compared to RadarSat 1 and 2. New in the sense that we're looking at multiple polarizations. In RadarSat 1 and 2, we'll be using a single polarization. Polarization is just another way of transmitting the microwave signal. You can have two polarizations. We are currently using the horizontal polarization. In RadarSat 3, we'll be using horizontal and vertical polarization. The two polarization will allow the users to see some salient features that's just not visible by using a single polarization radar. The other feature is multiple frequencies, center frequencies. On RadarSat 1, we're currently operating at C-band. And that's very good for certain applications, but not as good for other applications. So the plan is to have at least three different center frequencies on RadarSat 3. And the frequency will probably be L-band, C-band, and X-band. Um, Another feature of RadarSat 3 will be new instruments, scatterometers, which is just a way of monitoring the reflectivity of certain targets or images on the ground. An altimeter, which will give a complete map, a height map of the world. And a radiometer, which measures the, um, the radar signature of different objects. Technology is being envisaged is digital signal processing, onboard digital signal processing, more digital signal processing in the transmitter and receiver, and the use of solid state amplifiers so that we don't have to fly the big TWTs that we're currently using. That's it. Thank you very much. Yes. CSAT, I think, was working at l -Ban for one. And if, if memory serves me right, it only had a resolution probably between 25 to 30 meters in range and azimuth. In radar sat, as you, you'll see when you get the brochures, we're trying to get up to 10 meters resolution. So it would be much finer detail image. And as I, I mentioned before, we'll have the capabilities of a number of other modes of operation, like ScanSAR, for instance. I think CSAT was only about 100 kilometers total coverage. We'll have up to 500 kilometer coverage. Power? The power is probably high in RadarSat. I, I'm, I can't recall what was the power in uh, CSAT. But you only intended. No, we'll have full global coverage, as I think one of the slides Bob showed, within how many days, Bob? Seven days? Yes, because we, we, have, we have access to anywhere in the world mm. in a seven-day period. Yeah. There will be other ground stations. We have a tape recorder, so we don't need ground station. We could image uh, any part of the Earth, store it on the tape recorder, and as the satellite passes over Ottawa or Gatineau, we don't link the image. Yes, we are. We are concerned. I, I didn't show it because it's just a tape recorder. It was actually used in Landsat. It's one of Landsat tape recorders. We're flying two tape recorders for that purpose. And they're, they're reasonably confident that they'll fly the mission. The reliability figures say they should. <laughs> <laughs> How long is the mission? How long is the mission? Five and a quarter years.
There's not instruments to do that, but we have the data, the ephemeris data and the satellite. We have um, satellite positioning information that will tell us. We know the geometry of the satellite. So if we know the position, the exact, the exact orbit position over the Earth, we could calculate exactly where it's imaging. I think it's within a couple meters. Bob, do you, do you know the, Bob, the uh, prediction accuracy? You mean ranging up to the satellite? No, the imaging, the geopositioning accuracy, I think that's what he's referring to. The reason I'm interested is I saw an image from the ERS where you can track ships by their weight for up to 60 to 100 kilometers using the, uh, their radar uh, for fisheries control. It would be very, very interesting to accurately pinpoint where these ships are at certain yeah. times and mm -hmm. prove that they're fishing about fish in the water. Well, that's what I said. Going all the way back to the 1977 uh, satellites and sovereignty report, that was all the big things I wanted to do. Certainly the accuracy would be good enough to do that. The, the satellite is a very stable platform. It, it uh, points in pitch rolling off within about 0.05 of a degree. And uh, in as much as you're, you're coming up over land masses whose geography you know, Would you say it's the tens of meters? Within actually tens of meters? Yeah. How much will data cost and what degree will it be available to the public free of charge? Is anyone from RSI in here? We've got a RSI is meant to be a commercial program and not just a scientific satellite. There's a company being developed within Canada and run by uh, commercial industries called RSI, Rarasat International, I think that's what it stands for. And they've been doing some um, user survey to see what price the user community will bear. And I, I, don't think, I don't think they've come to any fixed price. Will materials be available for educational purposes? Yes, better? yes. I think, as Bob mentioned, the Americans are actually giving us the, the, the rocket, the Delta rocket for free. And we will be providing them with data for free. And I think a lot of that information will be used for scientific research. Right. Yeah. So and, and the Canadian government, even though, as I said, it's supposed to be a, a commercial program, because the Canadian government is paying a large part of this um, development and launch, will be entitled to free data. funding
NASA is about a $50 million rocket. So that we're still uh, paying the majority of, of it here. But uh, someone asked a question about other ground stations. It certainly is the intention with RSI to encourage other countries to put in their own ground stations um, and take data indeed just as we are taking data from the from the uh, spot satellite here. But they, they, for a large country like Brazil, it's just a perfect country for this sort of thing. But as for us, they can't keep an eye on it. They would put in their own station and, and be paying at a, at a certain rate for the data that they receive into it. You want to take that, Bob? Other than going into the eclipse, what factors prevent you from operating the radar continuously? It gets hot. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, uh, the operation uh, spec calls for 28 minutes per orbit of operating, and uh, the Earth takes about 100 minutes. So uh, it, these tubes uh, begin to warm up pretty rapidly, yeah. and, and they just reach their peak. Mm -hmm. so but also power, I guess, because uh, with 28 minutes of operation, the, uh, we're, if we were to do that every orbit, we'd begin to dip into the batteries, so uh, the solar array would do it. What's the biggest uh, of the record? 15 minutes. They can uh, record for 15 minutes. People should. Yeah. And then it takes another 15 minutes to dump. So to operate the satellite, you actually have to know if that's a sensitive want to look at. No, you, you could program your image tape 24 hours in advance or more, depending. Because the payload computer stores the information, the commands, and you time tag the commands. So I could program it when it flies over tonight to take an image over the Amazon rainforest next week. And it will do it. It has a clock on board. Exactly. A little bit more difficult to program there. Uh, I mean, for, for emergency events such as uh, floods and bad oil spills and things, you, you could do it quicker than that. But uh, in general, the, the regular customers expect that you would have them lined up at least a couple of days ahead for the program to be broadcast. So uh, that the computer is turning things on and off and regulating. So, uh, just, uh, we do about 14 orbits per day around the world, and of them, uh, about nine intersect the Canadian stations, so we have pretty good visibility to take the telemetry down. Uh, of course, it's essential to make sure that everything's operating within temperature and everything is going on track. I think we had one more question. Stay far from that one. We found some underwater Yes. To what depth can it depends on the frequency of the radar, the center frequency you're using. Um, the normal trend is the lower the frequency, the deeper you can go. Can you see the mid Atlantic uh, ridge? Yes, I saw an image from SOR B, the one that went in the last shuttle, um, SAR. And it actually showed a very deep gully within the Atlantic. And apparently, some of the old pirates knew about this gully. And they used to hide there for the merchant ships. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't think we should give uh, the impression that it could see down to the ocean. Depth. No. It really, it's the, the artifacts. The water at the bottom mm -hmm. reflects up onto the surface mm -hmm. in subtle ways. And the, uh, the activity of the surface is mm -hmm. what is. Uh, Although it, with the SIR-B radar that was used on, uh, on the uh, 31A shuttle flight that uh, Garneau was in, they, they discovered a most unusual thing, an unexpected thing in the, in the Libyan desert. It was very, very dry sand. And it, it was really penetrating through these sand dunes down to uh, three or four meter depth. And they found all sorts of uh, archaeological uh, ruins and riverbeds and things that uh, 
they're totally invisible to, to Ramsat. That was under, under conditions of a very, very arid uh, desert. So what is it possible to do, like, sea state? Sea state, yes, yes, and that's exactly what ERS one is doing right now. It's actually doing a, a map of all the seas in the world because they they plan. Like the wave yes, they not only do um, tidal forecasting, but they actually do wind speed by looking at the wave perturbations. Why can't you like to oh, that's a good question. The uh, you can certainly point to these multi-stage rockets, the, uh, the earlier stages, first and second stage, don't remain in orbit. They tumble back down to Earth. To get into that uh, sun-synchronous orbit I described, you actually have to uh, launch north so that you, you go just a bit to the left of the North Pole. So if you can imagine yourself on the east coast of Florida, you'd be launching up over the eastern uh, seaboard of uh, the United States and Canada, so these big hunky rockets would be falling back, back into uh, populated areas. So when you go out to Vandenberg, the, uh, the California location is out on a point that juts out into the Pacific, so these uh, rocket stages just tumble down into the ocean there. And so from uh, from eastern test range, from, from uh, Cape Kennedy, you can shoot due east and about 57 degrees uh, north of east in, in the north direction. Roberta Bondar's uh, shuttle flight was at such an inclination that uh, you could see it over Canada. Now, most of the flights they do from there are due east, which gives them about a 28 degree inclination. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, there's two questions. So first of all, I'm interested in the, the, the rationale or the justification for it in terms of coastal surveillance and sovereignty. Um, yeah, is there any mechanism in place to uh, inform the appropriate folks within Canada who might be interested in that? What's going on? I mean, has, has that been progressed at all? Yeah, well, yeah it's been done uh, in conjunction with, uh, with the Coast Guard so that they, uh, they would have access to the, uh, the data in those coastal regions. There isn't uh, any any uh, national defense uh, involvement in radar side. There's no military uh, application. Well, I, I suppose they could use it, but there, there are other military satellites, probably American design, that they could use. But for the, uh, it's been very well integrated. All, all of the remote sensing work in Canada, way back to 1972, has been done in a very well. Uh, coordinated fashion. They have annual get-togethers in which they all compare what they're doing. The various provinces each have their own uh, remote sensing groups and the uh, Canadian Coast Guard is always well represented in those uh, functions. The next question is, I don't believe there's any such thing as a pre-launch. We're getting a pre-launch on a Delta II in exchange for the data. Uh, I wonder why the United States is interested in acquiring that data and related to that, I wonder what the capabilities of the current civilian uh, radar satellites are. The question was asked to the sea satellite. What about the ERS? I understand the, the Japanese just launched the radar satellites. How do we compare with them? Well, those ones, certainly ERS, um, CSAT, the, the ones on the two shuttle flights, um, <laughs> And ERS-1 and the Japanese one, which was just launched recently, are all of a, of a quite an experimental nature. They have a very narrow swath width, about 75 uh, kilometers wide. Very, the power availability only enables them to stay on for about five minutes uh, per orbit. And uh, they have quite a multitude of other experiments that are running at the same time that are all competing for the time, uh, power time, and the, and the paper quarter time. So that um, this is why the United States is interested. They don't have uh, such a satellite of their own. And uh, the data is quite quite valuable. Those, that variety of applications you saw there uh, translates into, into uh, 
good value for the man on the on the street or the businessman, and they like to have that that data. But they're only getting their share of it if they're only shipping in a fifty million dollar rocket in a five hundred million dollar program, then they'll only get ten percent of the data. So we worked that way with NASA on many previous programs. The TDS satellite, the two ISIS satellites, the uh, two earlier Alouette satellites were all done uh, in, in that cooperative mode. And, and I must say it works quite well because the, uh, they're very uh, generous in providing extra help. They provided some of the equipment that went on to uh, those earlier research satellites. And uh, they're, they're providing uh, some extra ground station coverage in our case. Any other questions? What readiness would be used for calibrating the system? Calibration? You want me to take it? That's a question. There is a, I didn't show it, unfortunately, because my watch went to the same time. I skipped it. There is an internal calibration system built into the radar, which will do internal calibration within orbit. Apart from that, there's plans to, to implement a ground-based calibration site. Which will calibrate the antenna right, on the part. Side of which side? No, I don't think that's been decided yet. I was I'm curious about it. the maintenance features and how they need involvement. Maintenance. Maintenance. <coughs> like they, they, do they have built-in systems that if they're subject to malfunction that they Yeah. You know, yeah. The computer is actually the maintainer. The janitor. It monitors the health of all of the subsystems on board it. It's wrong. And as I said, these things to do internal calibration and health checks. So it's not really part of the radar, the support systems. What we have built in is a, uh, a neat thing called a save fold mode. And uh, if any one of a fairly long list of things uh, happens, even though the satellite may be way over on the far, far side of the Earth, uh, it will immediately start shutting down everything. And uh, going into a very low power mode in which it, uh, it is continually looking at the sunlight, even though the, uh, it may be the attitude control system that freaked out. And uh, it will remain in that mode uh, totally autonomously and, and wait for, uh, we can then wait for it to come around back in range of our ground stations where we can begin interrogating the telemetry system. The telemetry uh, system itself has its own private little tape recorder, quite apart from this big $8 million job that Patrick has for the data. And so it, it would play back to us what was going on, sort of like a, a black box, I suppose, in a crashed aircraft, or what uh, was going on when the, when the system crashed. Um, 15 minutes in record time, how much data are you accumulating there? How many, how many megs of data is that or gigs? Quite a bit, I think it's not even gigs, it's gigabits. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me? 85 megabits That's the data rate, yes. I think you're talking about class in 15 bits, it's in gigabits? Yeah. It's a couple of gigabits of data on each tape. In terms of a swap length, it's of those circles. It takes about 15 minutes to go across that circle, so from up in Greenland somewhere down to Florida somewhere, swap that wide, that long and 500 kilometers wide. Well, perhaps a little less wide if we're going on tape recorder, but uh, it's, it's a vast amount of data. It's the same tape recorder, by the way, that's used not only in the ERS-1 satellite and the uh, Landsat, but also it's up there in the uh, Japanese ERS-1. It has a fair amount of track record behind it. And I know many of you probably heard of a very bad reputation of tape recorder tiles, but this one is really a pretty good one. Well, you know, I've heard about back in the Landsat where you have people going out to the field and sampling what the train was like so then they could compare it with what images they're getting and they can extrapolate to other areas of the world. Does this have to be done with the radar sat program as well? Not as a great extent, but some of the pioneer satellites, because we do have a large database 
the images, how images react to certain frequencies. But as I said, we will have calibration sites which will calibrate the images from the satellite that the satellite is producing. Uh, I don't see the need. It's quite a large database right now that tells us how certain crop types react to microwave signals. The second one, just a bit more on that, uh, Rob, the Canada Center for Remote Sensing has had, running for some time, uh, a project called uh, Data Development, Radar Data Development Program, RDD, and, uh, and that's just what that's about. They have these uh, aircraft that are fitted with the T-band stars, and uh, they have done a lot of the Canadian interest. It has to do with the Arctic ice and when the ice flows out off the East Coast. And so they'll do a mission where they'll have uh, vessels on the surface, uh, you know, smaller type uh, research vessels, uh, with helicopters and with uh, people actually crawling around on the ice floes and then the satellite, not the satellite, but the uh, aircraft uh, going overhead to, uh, to get the best information they can on uh, extraction of information from the image to know what it really does. Can I ask a question? Uh, as you said, you interpret the, the image that you get is interpreted by people, whether this is uh, a soya bean that's growing there or whatever it is. And you also have this stored in, the, in your uh, uh, sort of a bank of information to you that you can uh, apply the thing. All the images taken by rare samples, most of them, will be archived in the Canadian. Yeah. Well, if you supposing you're on a certain area, and you may uh, run that same thing, say uh, two, two or three days later, to see if there's any movement or motion, just like the astronomers do. You take a photograph now, and you take one 20 years later, and you, well, you know that, but, and you notice motion or change of terrain type of thing. And if you're really interested in this, the farmers, the great facility to crop the going over the Have you ever seen something you couldn't interpret? I know the conditions are open. But there are people. There are people trained in doing it. It's yeah. interpreting it. Yeah. Yeah. Any further questions? Just a, just a supplement. The, uh, the resolution of the SAR on the radar side, what, how does it vary with the different uh, configurations? As I said, the fine beams, what we call the fine beams, the ones that use the widest bandwidth, remember the equation, has resolution on typically down to 8 to 10 meters. Right? And the other beams, if we go to the 11 megahertz bandwidth, they will go to 28 to 30 megahertz resolution. So that's how the range we could get from 10 to 30 meters resolution. I have a couple of unrelated questions. The first of them is, uh, for the pulse processor and for the control computer, are commercial products used or is that all custom built? Fairly all of it is custom built. Yeah. The computer itself is built using integrated circuits, specific application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, which is all custom built. Then the second question is kind of far out. Would you be able to turn is your sensitivity such that you could turn the thing around and look at the moon? No. Wait a minute. You would have to like that, right? <laughs> 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 we do do a strange thing, though, that I'm glad you gave me an excuse to mention, is that the uh, Americans have a particular interest in Antarctica, and uh, this radar looks one way, and that's to the right. So as we go sailing past the North Pole, uh, we're looking that way. And indeed, as you saw, we have coverage that sweeps over the, the whole polar cap. Unfortunately, when we go on down into Antarctica, we're looking the other way. We're looking the way the distance direction away from Antarctica. Now, they didn't like that too much because there's a big hole in the middle there. So on two occasions, we're going to turn the whole damn satellite around and fly it backwards so that it uh, takes the nice pictures of Antarctica. We'll run it for about a week. They want to do that uh, during the period of maximum ice and the period of minimum ice because that, that whole central zone of uh, Antarctica is, is of extreme interest to them, the, the level, the topography of it, <coughs> so forth. So we'll we'll do that much. We'll go and fly our airplane backwards, but uh, <laughs> upside down. 
we actually have to worry about the moon, by the way, because the um, Earth sensors and the sun sensors um, are, are going to occasionally see the moon, and we have to make sure that they don't get, they're not confusing, getting confused with the moon in, in their attempts to centralize the Earth. The main vertical reference, of course, is an Earth uh, horizon sensor, which looks in all directions around the horizon and centers up the spacecraft to um, go that way. We have earth sensors, sun sensors, and, and the mag magnetometer as well to give position reference. Yes. I, I, sorry, I thought that was an excellent question. But if, if, it, if there must be something in the physics that prevents you from doing it, why, but why can't you turn around and, and heck with the moon? And why can't you look at Alpha Centauri if indeed <laughs> your well, well, uh, well, resolution is not dependent on the range? There has to be something in there. <laughs> Who's <laughs> <laughs> who's managed by images on the moon? <laughs> well, if it doesn't, if you can put a, if you can put up a, a satellite to replace a radar satellite and get images of, of, the, of distant, of truly distant objects, other planets, for example, why why isn't that? Uh, a good I, I, I was speaking too quickly. The control system is very uh, is very flexible, and it, it also has its own little computer going on in it to tell it how to do things if we go into one of these nasty safe hold modes and uh, get into a wild gyration that will take control and bring it back up onto the direction we want so that one could feed the control laws in there and, uh, and aim the thing. I don't know what, what would there be any real value in, in radar doing aim it radar imaging of the moon from space any more, any better than you could do it from the Earth. There's, There's no cause conference. We're only 800 kilometers uh. further away here. But it uh, could be theoretically done, but it's terrible. You wouldn't believe how much added cost it's been just to do this little simple turnaround maneuver to make the Americans happy to do coverage of Antarctica. And it would be very, very pricey to add in that kind of issue. Okay, a couple more questions. Yeah. You have a computer controlled base or antenna. Why can't you get to the point right as well as what the software is? There's a certain limit to which we could stay the antenna beam, actually. It's not 360, still 360 degrees. We have a range, I think, from about 20 degrees to 60 degrees. There's a limitation of DPS, and the actual mechanics of the, the antenna. Okay. Okay. So the antenna is probably sort of facing to the right. Yes, yeah, and so it's flat as well. Out. Mechanically, it's fixed. You could, you could theoretically, and, and indeed this was studied when, when it, they, they wanted the Antarctic thing to simply go into a 60 degree roll and so that um, it does what I think you had in mind. The problem with that is that the, uh, all of the Earth sensors and the, uh, and the uh, Diodomic antenna are now pointing 60 degrees off of where they should be pointing, so they've all got to be either duplicated or scribbled over this way. Does your basic limitation come from how much of a phase that you could get from each antenna? It's how much phase control you could get, the range of phases you could get out of the DPS limitation. So I forgot to mention, but in Redis at 3, that's an option we're looking at, to fly two antennas, one looking to the left and one to the right. And that will help you get three dimensional images as well. Okay, AJ, your last question. How similar is the radar set to the uh, SAR found on Magellan? They, I think there's a lot of similarity. Uh, some of the Canadian uh, scientists who work with us are principal investigators on Magellan. And um, I think it's, I think the, the radar has some similarity. It is even, I think, on Magellan. It's, but what I know it's uh, on Magellan, rather than using the electronic beam steering as we have, they actually moved the entire spacecraft. But said we couldn't do because of these little antennas we have. On Magellan, they have a much wider um, antenna. So they could move it around mechanically to get a different elevation beam. Uh, I'm not sure about the frequency. The resolution, from what I could recall, it, is worse than radar sets, about 30 meters a day. asked me to uh, come up and uh, thank the speakers tonight. And I think this has a, been a very interesting lecture for me because uh, before, the, uh, before the meeting, uh, Robert 
mentioned that uh, he'd been involved in uh, the uh, spacecraft design course at University of Toronto. And I actually took that course back in 1984. And uh, one thing I learned there was that spacecrafts are a real technological tour de force. Even the, uh, the mechanics of controlling the batteries are, are mind-bogglingly complicated, much less anything else in the spacecraft. Um, other thing about that course is that we, our project for the course was to design radar sat. And so we formed up into groups. And one of, I took the payload, as it happens, and different people had attitude control systems and such. And we designed a, a radar set, which looked nothing like the model we have today. <laughs> uh, interesting enough, it did look somewhat like one of the pictures you showed of the early versions. Um, it's also interesting to see that your versions changed a lot over the years. <laughs> and and uh, it is a very sort of an interesting process. And it's very reassuring to see that this actually came to something after all these years. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, very um, exciting that Canada is involved in such an um, uh, important space program that it's um, a leading edge type of uh, program. And it's uh, certainly very impressive that we have this type of ability in Canada and that we're uh, continuing to support that work here. And so on behalf of the Astronomical Society, uh, I'd like to uh, thank both of you for your excellent presentation tonight.